Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Timothy Adams, and this is my analysis of the R. Kelly jury verdict. And here's some information on what's to come. Today's post is brought to you by A Melanin Christmas because your Christmas should look like you. All right, the jury came back guilty on all counts for R. Kelly. And they came back extremely quickly with just one full day of the liberations. The jury got the case last Friday afternoon and came back um, with their verdict today, Monday. Uh, today's afternoon, they did not work over the weekend. And keep in mind on Friday, they even sent a note to the court about like during the liberations. So they came back very quickly. I've had juries on drug cases come take longer to deliberate than they did on this case, which uh, is an indication to me that the jury had their minds made up. Um, because of the amount of evidence that was involved, there's no way that the jury, you know, reviewed all of the evidence because there were letters, there were um, lots of things taken from his storage, and there were videos. Just reviewing the videos and the letters alone would have taken more than a day. So I guess the jury said, hey, we don't see any of that or any more of that. And they made their decision. Um, I have to be honest, I think part of the decision that they made was emotional because of, you know, when cases involve children um, or minors in this in the appropriate sense um, and if there are parents on the jury then you know people take that with them and especially when a lot of the witnesses in the case they testified to things that were not crimes but they they were they showed a, a pattern of behavior so uh, those are things that I'm pretty sure that the jury considered in their verdict so what's next is a pre-sentencing report will be created. Uh, we call it a PSR. A PSR is a report that's created uh, which tells the judge more information about R. Kelly personally and about the offense. And at the end, it gives a sentencing range uh, for the offense. Now, the PSR, um, the interview is done with Mr. Kelly, his attorney, and the probation officer. The probation officer also gets information from, uh, from the government or the government witnesses as well to create the report. So the first part of any PSR is about the person, um, age, where they grew up at, siblings, marital status, kids, where the kids live, does he, is he on child support form, his financials, and they ask for financial information um, because they want to know if the person can afford to pay a fine. They also, they also get the person's like credit report, all types of stuff. Um, they also get information about the person's family, how they grew up, were their needs met, were they victim of a crime or any type of abuse when they were um, a kid. And from there, the report begins to talk about the offense and the details of the offense. And because he has so many different counts, each count um, gets assigned. So let's just say he has, I don't know, 20 counts or whatever it is. So there's a section for each count. So let's just say the rack, one of the racketeering counts. So it's like, oh, this is the statute for this. This is the base offense level. Now the offense level is a number that's assigned uh, by statute for the offense. So a base level racketeering, the base offense level is 19, but the, it can be different um, depending on various factors. So let's just say the um, racketeering has a base level of 19. Then from there, if there are any type of enhancements that are available, then the enhancements are added. So let's just say in a standard um, robbery, Hobbs Act robbery in the federal system, my client has a gun during the robbery and he brandishes it or he fires it. There's another in a uh, five to seven point enhancement on there for whatever acts he did with the gun. So that would take the whatever the base fence offense level up by however many points it is. So from there, we go through that through the PSR, however many counts it is. And then if some of the counts fall under the same statute, that's what we call grouping, which is saying, okay, well, these offenses are all under the same statute. So these offenses, we're going to, let's say it's four racketeerings, then we're going to add four points to the overall offense level. 
And from there, at the end of the report, there is whether or not there should be a fine, if there's restitution, and his punishment range. Now, from what I understand, R. Kelly has zero criminal history. So, in the sentencing guidelines, let's back up, criminal history um, is assigned through category. So, there's a category 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, criminal history category number 6 is the worst. So, in that situation, if you have a, a category 6 or 2 or whatever it is, you're facing more time than someone who's in category 1, which means they have little to no uh, criminal history. So, R. Kelly is going to be in criminal history, criminal history category number 1. So, if his... Um, offense level was 19, then you get the range by that cross point, and that's pretty low. Uh, the charges that carry the most, uh, the highest offense level is the Mann Act violations. But even with those violations, with no criminal history, his punishment range is still low. And keep in mind, he has two years or almost two years of back time. I'm not sure if all the back time applies to this case because he also had some that was... Um, some back time that he got from the Chicago case. So they may or may not give him credit for that, depending on whether or not the indictment for the Eastern District was already out and if they had a detainer on him. But either way, those are just, that's just lawyer talk. So um, his range is pretty low um, because he has no criminal history, plus he has his back time and he will get credit for his time served. That he has, that he has served, let me rephrase that. But, one thing that I expect is for the government to file um, a request for what's called an upward departure. And an upward departure says, yes, judge, we know that this person has very little criminal history and that his punishment range is low. However, we think this person is a really bad person or the sentencing range does not fit the crime. So judge, we want you to consider the full statute, the full range under the statute. So let's go back to, let's just say a drug case. And let's say the client's punishment range is 30 to 36 months. However, my client was, you know, a really bad guy and, you know, branded some girl with a hot iron and she's traumatized for life and has PTSD and he kicked a kid or something like that. The government can say, oh no judge, even though his range is 30 to 36 months, the full punishment range is zero to 20 years. We want you to sentence him higher than what his range is. And that's common practice, especially in cases like this, where the person has is accused of doing something really bad, but they have little criminal history. Um, and yeah, so, However, the defense, I'm pretty sure, if they, because it'd be horrible if they didn't, should file what's called a request for a downward departure. And when a downward departure is it says, "Hey, judge, we know the range is X, Y, and Z, but we would like for you to depart lower and sentence him lower than his range because of these factors that we're going to list in this motion." Now, the thing is, the judge can do whatever he or she wants. The judge, well, she, sorry. The judge does not even have to follow the range the, that is recommended. The judge can consider the full range of punishment under the statute. If the statute says you can consider zero to 20 years, she can sentence him to zero to 20 years based on her own whatever. Also, for sentencing, um, the PSR. So you have the PSR interview, the report is created. Each side gets to file objections to the PSR. Let's just say from a defense uh, prospect perspective, sorry, I think that no, a sentencing enhancement should not apply or that the probation officer got certain facts wrong. Those are things that I file in my objections to the pre-sentence report. And the government can do the same thing. They can say, oh no, the probation officer got this wrong, this should be that way, and so on and so forth. From there, each side submits their objections. The probation officer who does the report goes back 
um, reviews each person's objections and he can agree or disagree with them. If he agrees, he changes it. If he doesn't agree on the date of sentencing, the judge determines whether or not the objection is sustained or overruled. And if it's overruled, that means she does not agree with the objection. If it's sustained, that means she agrees with it. And that will change his offense level right there in court. So, um, and by the way, the PSR is something no one is ever going to see other than his attorneys, the government and the judge and the probation officer. PSRs are confidential. Um, also at sentencing, each party can present witnesses. I'm pretty sure the government is going to present witnesses. Um, hopefully our Kelly's team is going to present witnesses and a lot more than what they presented for his defense. Um, for his defense, they only brought a handful of witnesses compared to the government's 45 witnesses. And the problem with that is this, jurors want to see information from the defense. I've had that happen in a case and um, the government had lots of exhibits or evidence in the case. In the defense, we didn't have as many because we don't have the burden of proof. And each juror is informed of the burden of proof and that we aren't required to present anything. However, jurors still told us that, no, we wanted to see more from you all. That case ended in a hung jury, but it's the same thing in this type of case. Because if the government can bring 40 plus witnesses and you only bring five, it's just like, ah, uh, from even from a common sense perspective, it's like, well, yeah, I know I'm supposed to not consider that, but why does he only have five witnesses? So, yeah, that was pretty tough. Now, uh, appeal. Everyone who goes to trial in a federal case has the right to appeal. That's not going to change. Um, you can file notice of appeal 14 days after the judgment. So they can file a notice of appeal now. 14, they, have, they have 14 days from now to file a notice of appeal. But typically, you don't file a notice of appeal until after your client has been sentenced. Because if you file it now versus after they're sentenced, the, there may be issues at sentencing that you also want to appeal. And it would be pointless to file the notice of appeal now because you don't know what's going to happen at sentencing and whether or not you're going to have a basis for appeal for any of those things. Um, there's also several post-trial motions that can be filed. Most commonly are a Rule 29 motion and a Rule 33 motion. A Rule 29 motion is basically saying, hey, judge, we believe that based on the facts and the evidence, the jury got it wrong. Those motions are rarely granted, and I guarantee if the um R. Kelly's defense files one in this case, it's going to be overruled. It's just something you do to preserve your record for appeal. Also, you can file what's called a Rule 33 motion, which is a motion for new trial. I've done these before. These are more commonly granted than Rule 29 motions. Um, there are two types of motion for new trials. The one that I see most commonly and the one that I've done most commonly is a motion for new trial based on new evidence. You have three years from the date of the judgment to file a motion for new trial based on new evidence. They may or may not get new evidence, um, but they definitely should. The One of the things that I definitely would be doing at this point is getting my investigator ready to go out and talk to these jurors and get more information from them and get feedback from them. Now, the uh, government and the defense, they are now able to speak with the jurors if they want to speak with them because the case is now over. So when speaking with jurors, you may get some great information that you can use for appeal. Now, this case, um, from what I understand, he was offered a plea deal and didn't take it. And I said this before because the outcome of this case would likely affect the outcome of the other cases. So say for instance, if he got found not guilty on this case, these prosecutors in Chicago may say, hey, we may or may not move forward with this case because we're going to have the same similar witnesses and we may have the same issues. So it may not be the best case thing to retry the case in Chicago or do the case in Chicago because it may end up in the same result. Or in this case, he got found guilty, then he may, R. Kelly may be willing to enter into a plea agreement 
for the Chicago case to go ahead and get it over with and get on to where he's going. Um, so after sentencing, an inmate is assessed by the BOP, which is the Bureau of Prisons, for their custody level based on their criminal history and their offense. And they are assigned to whatever jail um, the BOP assigns them to um, per the First Step Act. Now the BOP has to try to place someone um, in a jail at least 300 miles or within 300 or 250 miles from their home. So that's one thing. However, he won't be sent straight to BOP custody because he still has the case in Chicago. So he probably won't go into BOP custody. Um, and let me just say this, he's in BOP custody now, but I mean BOP custody as far as going to his assigned jail or penitentiary, however you want to put it. So he won't be assigned, going to his assigned facility until the other case is resolved. Um, just in case they do send him to his assigned facility, he will be taken back to Chicago at some point and taken to a different facility until the Chicago case is resolved. Um, and those are my thoughts on the verdict. Send me any questions. Um, I will make an ask, um, ask me a question post on Instagram for any questions that you all have. Have a good day.